in first. It's Cecile O'Connor here from the WA Marine Science Institution. Thanks so much, um, St James, for joining us and Professor Nicole Jones, of course, who is a physical oceanographer at the University of Western Australia. She uses a combination of field observations and numerical modelling to study primarily primarily relatively small scale ocean dynamics, including turbulent mixing, internal waves and ocean eddies. And understanding these processes is vital to quantify the transport of heat pollutants and nutrients around the ocean. So we're very lucky to have her uh, giving this presentation this morning and I'll hand over now to Professor Nicole Jones. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Cecile. Great, well, thanks uh, for all being here today. Um, I'm very excited to uh, present uh, to you all. Um, so I was asked to cover two topics with you today, and um, that is both the impact of climate change on global sea levels, and the second one is on the meridional overturning circulation. So, um, First of all, I'll just kind of say as a physical oceanographer, what I do is um, study ocean currents, so the ocean physics, uh, ocean mixing processes. Um, and so I don't know a whole lot about, you know, what happens to the biology or the chemistry of the ocean. Really what it, my expertise is in is um, how the ocean moves. But the thing about that is that um, because the, you know, the ocean is a course of fluid, is that pretty much everything relies um, in some way on the ocean physics or is impacted by the ocean physics. So it's kind of a, you know, a very fundamental thing that we need to understand in order to understand how the ocean is functioning. So as I said, the first thing uh, um, throughout the presentation is we'll get um, you to interact a little bit with um, uh, just so I can get some feedback from you. So the first one really is just a trial uh, kind of question to make sure that you can all get online and we can get um, a number of responses that approximately uh, matches um, the number of uh, students we have in the class. Of course, teachers are welcome to join in too. Um, so the first question is, what word comes into your mind when you think about global mean sea level? So, as people are putting in their answers here, we're seeing um, a word cloud being generated uh, with the uh, most popular word at the moment being uh, ocean. And we can see as more people put in their responses. I don't actually know how many of you are in the classroom today, but um, hopefully we're, okay, so we're pretty close to having all of our, our responses in there. Okay, so what else have we got? Uh, we've got sea and ocean, uh, rising temperature. That's a good one to have. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the role that temperature plays in causing global sea level rise. But increasing, that's certainly uh, true, um, high uh, height and level. All right, so I think everyone's figured out how to use the Mentimeter uh, and um, don't be distracted, of course, by your devices. Watch the screen in between, but then we'll have some questions every few slides or so. So my little introductory slide um, is really just to say, well, we are concerned about understanding um, the impact of climate change on both global sea level rise and the meridional overturning circulation because these changes are already occurring and we need to be able to project uh, what is likely to occur in the future, I think for two main reasons. One is the changes are occurring and even if we stopped all of our greenhouse emissions today, they would still continue uh, to occur. Um, and so we need to understand what, is, what are going to be the outcomes so that we can plan and this will help us in our kind of resilience um, as we face, you know, what, what will be some change. But I think also importantly, it, it motivates us and us as humans, not necessarily us in the room here, because certainly you as, as children are not responsible for, for what has and is occurring, but to really think about and motivate us to take action as humans um, when we can see that uh, 
there are such um, big things that will occur if we don't take action now. Um, we hopefully will be motivated um, as the human race to, to uh, take action to, to really severely reduce our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So these are just two examples here. On your left, you can see um, some islands uh, in the Pacific Ocean, which are being heavily impacted by uh, increases in mean sea level. And certainly there are many island um, uh, areas where people have already had to leave and relocate. Uh, and then the image on the right here is showing uh, what would happen to the uh, air temperatures um, across the globe if the um, radional overturning circulation were to shut down completely. So you can see those much cooler air temperatures that would occur in the northern hemisphere and the much warmer temperatures that would occur uh, in the southern hemisphere. Hopefully we will go nowhere near that um, outcome, but just, you know, numerical models are being done to uh, show what, what the impact would be. All right, so we're going to start with looking at the global uh, mean sea level. And so when we talk about global mean sea level, it's important to understand what all of those words mean to start with. So really what we're talking about here is not all the um, higher frequency things that cause the sea level to change. And of course, we know the tide uh, causes a large uh, change in sea level on a, you know, up to 12 hour basis. We also know that we can have things like storm surge, which when the conditions um, of a particular uh, atmospheric low pressure system move through, we can have um, dramatic uh, increases in our sea level rise, but then they will go away uh, when that storm has passed. But it's really that um, sea level that is increasing on, av um, on, on, on the average of all of those fluctuating signals. So we're looking for the signal that's in the increasing trend underneath what is actually a very um, highly variable uh, quantity. And when we say global, we mean we're also averaging over the entire globe. So that's what we're looking at here. It's the sea level um, since 1993. And why since 1993? Because 1993 was the year that we launched our first satellite uh, altimeter. And what a, uh, the altimeter does is it measures the height of the sea level from space. And so this is when we first be, were able to estimate the uh, sea level um, across the entire globe and take this average. There are earlier estimates, um, but this is the best estimates that we have um, because prior to that, we really just had um, our uh, tide gauges in our coastal regions and the, the deeper ocean we really couldn't monitor very well. And so you can see here, they've broken up this uh, record of uh, almost or just over 30 years now into uh, decades. And you can see that it's not just that it's an in increasing trend, but we can see that that rate of change in each decade has increased. So in this most recent decade, we've got the highest um, change per year that we've seen so far. And this is, I guess, what is particularly concerning, uh, that we're not just increasing, but these increases are occurring faster. Now, we know in over geological timescales, we've had fluctuations in the sea level, uh, certainly very large fluctuations that we used to be able to, you know, a long time ago, walk out um, to the edge of our continental uh, shelf. So hundreds of kilometres offshore, um, you know, down to depths of the ocean now that are um, 150 metres, we could walk out there, right? But what we're talking about here is the fact that humans have accelerated this sea level change uh, due to, um, well, two main reasons, which we're going to discuss in detail. But first, um, 
yeah, let's look at some of the some some of these mechanisms of what contributes to the mean sea, sea level rise. So I've got a little diagram here to um, demonstrate the uh, impact of the rising temperature. So temperature was one of the keywords that came out of our word cloud at the beginning. And it's very true. So as we've heated up the ocean, again, because of our uh, increase in greenhouse gases, we have caused uh, thermal expansion of the water. So anything that gets heated up, the atoms in that substance start to vibrate faster and faster. And so the volume of that, um, uh, of that substance increases, okay? So in the case of a fluid, it means that we actually have uh, a much larger expansion of that volume as the temperature increases and that leads to an increase in sea level. The other main reason for uh, an increase in the mean sea level is the melting of glaciers and ice sheets. And so um, this is something that's uh, reasonably easy to understand. You know, we had all of this uh, mass of water stored um, as ice uh, on land. Um, and because of increases in atmospheric temperatures, as well as increases in the ocean temperature, this ice uh, is melting at a faster rate than um, it has in the past and is not being replaced uh, by um, the precipitation that generates uh, more of the ice um, and also the ice formation um, that, that occurs in other areas. So, for example, in the glacier regions, there's a lot more rainfall occurring than there was previously snowfall. And so this means that the net amount of glacier that's forming um, is reduced. So which of these two processes, thermal expansion or meltwater, do you think is currently the largest contributor to global mean sea level rise? Twenty-two votes. I mean, it's only got sixteen. I, I, I can't vote. My phone's in my laptop, so I can't vote. All right. So, um, the yep, we're, I think we're we're almost there. Don't worry, I'm not recording who is uh, who is answering what. So. You can just have a stab. All right, so we'll move on. Uh, so our this plot here now shows our top line that we had a couple of slides ago with our total sea level change. And then it divides it into our contributions from meltwater and our contributions from thermal expansion. So you can see that back in 2005, they were both pretty similar amounts contributing. And after that, we started to see the meltwater take off. Okay, so we've ended up uh, in a scenario, we not this plot doesn't go quite all the way out to where we are today, um, but meltwater continues to be our largest con contribution at the moment. So um, we are, had a little bit of um, uh, a uh, misconception of what our largest contributor was there. And this is, um, I think, you know, it's important to understand that a lot of these records and this ability to actually petition um, the mean level, sea level in this way has really come about from the creation of new observations. So we talked about the launch of the satellite um, altimeter in 1993 and then we were able to start doing these meltwater again mainly through satellite observations but different satellites that could observe um, our uh, volume of our glaciers and then the thermal expansion could only be observed once we 
uh, deploy enough of the Argo floats in the ocean. So Argo floats are profiling robots that go from the surface of the ocean down to its depths and they measure the temperature and salinity and depth and that allows us to uh, calculate the amount that the temp increase in temperature is contributing to the sea level. So you can see that technology is helping us to observe um, these processes in more detail, which then allows us to then put this back into um, things like our predictive models and improves our, um, our faith in the, in the predictions that we're producing. Okay, so we've talked about mean sea level, um, where it's averaged across the globe, but there's also a lot of spatial variation in sea level change. And so this figure here is showing you uh, regions in blue where we've had increases in sea level, and this is between 1993 and 2021. And red regions, so this area down here in the Southern Ocean, is showing uh, regions where we've had actually decreases in the sea level. And some of, there are also some dots which are showing you local estimates. And so these are from tide gauges mainly, uh, whereas the blue is showing you, um, uh, sorry, the larger area of, of, of the globe is covered um, by the altimetry. And so uh, you can see there's quite a bit of variation. There's some areas of the ocean where there's not been any sea level change, so white areas, and there's other areas which have been impacted a lot more. And this is really um, for two reasons. Uh, one is that the warmer areas of the ocean tend to um, uh, be more impacted by increases in heat in terms of translating into an increase in um, sea level height, so regions uh, like this here. But also we um, have large impacts for the fact that there's a whole system of currents that are transporting um, uh, water around the globe and then impact also the sea level. So you probably talked about some of these processes when you're learning about, you know, ocean gyres and things like that. Um, but we also have this impact um, of, uh, that impacts that change in sea level from, from what it was previously, because ocean currents are changing as, as, the, um, as the ocean is impacted by uh, climate change. And you'll also notice that some of these coastal areas here um, are actually positive. So, um, sorry, negative. Red. So, showing the red values, as in these levels are actually um, showing a decrease in sea level instead of an increase in sea level. So, these areas here are areas that are still uh, the land is still uh, rebanding um, from the glaciers that did exist in this uh, Pacific Northwest uh, region. So there are kind of some local um, things that occur uh, that um, mean that uh, the sea level is moving in the opposite direction. So next question for you, why do some coastal regions have enhanced sea level rise? And you can choose more than one in this case, if I've set it up correctly. All right, almost there, one more person. <coughs> Are we done? Yeah. All done? All done? So that's really interesting to see that uh, you selected regional ocean currents as, um, as the winner here, although erosion and ground settling and subsidence were um, close behind. So in fact all three of these processes are uh, contributing to enhanced sea level rise in some regions 
And so if we move on to the next slide here, we can see some examples of this. So certainly we did just talk about ocean currents contribute on a global scale, um, but also locally they can really impact um, what's happening to the sea level rise. So this is just an example uh, in the Gulf Stream where we've seen uh, regions that have um, uh, much higher uh, sea level uh, rise that have occurred um, because of changes to the Gulf Stream over that time. Uh, we certainly have areas this is um, that have been heavily impacted by erosion. Um, and so this is that famous example uh, on the New South Wales coast with someone's um, swimming pool falling into the ocean. Uh, and certainly some areas are very negatively impacted by the subsidence of the land. So this occurs a lot because of um, things like groundwater pumping, where if you're abstracting a lot of the groundwater, then there's all of the soil uh, settles uh, downward. And so the net effect is that the sea level rise is much greater in these regions. Um, now, the problem with just understanding increases in the global mean sea level is that it's not enough, right? What uh, one of the biggest problems that we face is actually what happens when you have these compound events. So you kind of have a slow increase in the global mean sea level, but then you're hit with some storm surge um, or you're hit with... Um, uh, you know, um, a, a um, I don't know the right word to describe it to you, but like a coastally trapped wave that's moving down the coast and instantaneously produces a higher sea, sea level at, um, for a few days. If all those things happen at the same time, then you're getting a much larger sea level that would cause, um, you know, flooding, overtopping, etc. So I put in this picture here of uh, one of the iconic uh, locations uh, close to the University of Western Australia that you're probably all familiar with, the Blue Boathouse. And, you know, normally people are out here on a nice day having their photo taken along this uh, jetty that leads out to this boathouse. Um, but today, on this day, the photo was taken. Uh, there is a large storm surge from a low pressure system. And that compounded with a with that, you know, we've only got micro tides here, but you know, some increase in the tidal level means we can um, actually have parts of the river that overtop. And so it's it's really the compound um, impact of of uh, the various things that cause sea level, um, because certainly there's it, you know, there's areas that you might have to, or and and will have to be uh, evacuated permanently but there's also risks to um, flooding that might occur episodically. And so what the figure on the right here is showing, um, which is from um, an IPCC, the most recent IPCC report, uh, is the amplification factor. So that means um, the number of times you would multiply by the one in 100 extreme sea level event. So you can see areas around the world where instead of having an event one in once in a hundred years, you if you have an amplification of 100, that means it's going to now occur every year. So you can see that there's many areas around Australia where we're getting quite significant uh, amplification factors, and certainly areas um, in the Pacific Ocean around these island nations that uh, are going to really um, be hit hard uh, because they won't tolerate, um, uh, you know, they'll be having multiple extreme sea level events um, each, each year. So this is, I guess, the thing to keep in mind with the global mean sea level, it's not everything you have to think about, the additional um, short-term events. All right, so that kind of finishes up our bit for now on the global mean sea uh, level, but we will go back to that because um, one of the things that impacts our meridional overturning circulation also impacts our sea level. So we'll think about that a little bit um, more uh, in a few slides. So meridional overturning circulation. Well, the first thing to point out is this 
phenomenon has many names and that is always annoying as a learner um, when you discover that the terminology is not consistent, right? So we also call this the ocean conveyor belt. We call Sorry. it the... Sorry? Sorry, the bell went. You might have heard that. Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> Um, we call we so the thermohaline circulation, the global ocean circulation. So all of these terms are referring to the same process. Um, so don't be confused uh, if something sounds similar but it has a different name. It's um, because it is used very inconsistently. So what is this circulation? Well, it's certainly a very slow circulation, and it's not the kind of circulation that you go at and you can uh, measure very easily. We actually measure it by measuring density differences and inferring the currents that would result. And the reason for this is the currents are, are uh, driven by density differences. So we all know at the equator, it's much warmer in the ocean than it is in the poles, but it's even more extreme than that if we look at the depth profile of the ocean. OK, so what's happening at the surface and what's happening closer to the seabed. And this little schematic here of a room with a heater and a window is going to paint the picture of what this um, ocean circulation looks like. So it's a cold day in winter, just imagine. So the air temperature outside this window is much cooler than the uh, temperature within the room itself. As the air passes by this window, it cools down dramatically through contact with that window. What happens to cold uh, as the air gets colder is it gets more dense. So we talked about thermal expansion. This one is thermal contraction, right? So the molecules in the air are slowing down and that means they are now taking up less volume, they're becoming more dense and they fall then to the floor. At the other end of the room we have our heater and what our heater does of course is it heats up the air, the molecules in the air are moving faster, they're expanding and become less dense and they rise to the ceiling. And what this sets up is this circulation cell where the air is flowing around the room and changing from warm to cold. And this is exactly, well, it's slightly more complicated in the ocean, but more or less, this is what happens in our uh, global ocean circulation. <clears throat> so this is still a very simplified diagram and it's very uh, North Atlantic uh, biased kind of view of the uh, meridional overturning circulation, but it paints the picture again that we have cold water that forms in the Labrador Sea that descends, so the red turns into blue here, down to the deepest depth of the ocean and circulates around the ocean before coming back up to the surface uh, around the equator. And so this is the pattern across our ocean. This uh, takes about 1,000 years um, for the water to go from being at the surface to moving through to the bottom and coming back up to the surface again. So it's a very long process. And that makes it important in terms of its role in quite a few processes in the ocean. And the reason why I'm saying quite a few is because I want you to tell me or think about what they might be. Oh, no, I can't do that because somehow my question slide has disappeared. All right, I will just tell you. OK, so in the ocean, um, when that water sinks from the surface to the seabed, it takes the properties of the water that are generated close to the surface. So it's in contact with the atmosphere at that point where it's generated, which means it can absorb gases like carbon dioxide and oxygen, and it will transport them all the way down to the abyssal ocean. So, you know, 
thousands and thousands of metres deep. So that means it re-oxygenates that deep water and it also means that it removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and transports it down into deep, deep depths of the ocean. So it helps to regulate the amount of carbon dioxide that we've put into the atmosphere. It also uh, absorbs heat. And so it also traps away uh, heat for very long periods of time. That um, means again, for a thousand years, some increase in temperature that we've produced in the atmosphere is locked away um, before it comes back to the surface. So you can see that it plays a very strong role in modulating uh, what's happening uh, in the atmosphere um, and uh, pushes those timescales out to be very long by trapping that water in the deep ocean. So if we look at the process of how that very cold, dense water is formed um, in a bit more detail, we can understand just why it becomes so dense. So this is an Antarctic uh, example. It's not dissimilar uh, in the Arctic case. Basically, you need a situation where you have very, very cold, cold water conditions. So in the Antarctic, what tends to happen is you have these uh, very, very cold winds that are formed by air blowing across the continent um, before it reaches the sea. And this leads to water being extremely cooled um, and it leads to the production also of ice. So cool water, obviously very dense, we know that. But on top of that, when ice is formed, the ice is just made of fresh water. So it also means that the um, salt is excluded and it makes the water very, very salty. Um, and that, so you have those two ingredients, you have both salt making the water more dense, as well as um, the water temperature being very cold, making the water more dense, and therefore it sinks. It's much, much more dense than any of this other water around it. So it wants to sink down very great depths um, to the uh, bottom of the ocean. Now you might think, well, why doesn't that water just mix with the other water? Why doesn't it all become the same temperature? Well, there's quite a big difference between the density of this water and the density of the water above it. And it's actually quite, it requires quite a bit of energy to mix um, waters of different density. Now, I don't know if this is a bad example for you guys because you're probably not supposed to drink coffee, um, but I'll use it anyway. Um, I can be, you know, pretty busy in my life and I'm making myself a coffee in the morning. If I put the milk from the fridge in the cup first and then I put it under the espresso machine, uh, which, you know, kind of quite gently drips the, water, uh, the, the coffee into the cup. If I don't take a spoon to stir that, then I will essentially drink um, a very vaguely milky coffee off the surface. And at the bottom of my cup, I'll get a big slug of just milk, right? And that's because of that density difference. I put the dense cold milk in the bottom first, and then the watery, warm, uh, lighter fluid, less dense fluid in the surface. And those things required some energy to mix. And if I don't provide that energy by stirring my spoon, um, then they remain what we call stratified. And so that's what the ocean is. It's very stratified with this warmer, uh, lighter water, less dense water, sitting on top of this very dense water. And this dense water actually has a signature um, that extends from the Antar from Antarctica where it's formed actually across the equator and all the way into the northern hemisphere, which I think is pretty remarkable really. Um, and so this is what is driving um, this, this uh, circulation. Now maybe you've already learnt the basics of this and I'm really supposed to maybe focus just on the change. So let's move on to the change. Um, so the 
we're going to consider the uh, Atlantic Ocean to start with, just um, because a lot there's a lot of focus on the Atlantic um, meridional overturning circulation. But the thing is, uh, unfortunately, with climate change, uh, we are slowing down uh, this overturning circulation. And the reasons for this is be is primarily because the water um, at the poles is uh, becoming uh, fresher um, and uh, also um, warmer. And so it's not going to be able to sink to those deep, deep depths. And that means that um, we won't have the production of that cold water and that will also then weaken um, the return current such as the Gulf Stream. So it's not only the cold currents that get weakened, it's also our warm currents um, that travel at the surface because they're part of, you know, if you if you think of that room and the, the, the circulation cell within that room, it's the same thing. If the, if the uh, bottom current's not strong, then the surface current won't be strong either. So there's quite a bit of debate and you probably, um, uh, you probably see this in, in your news feeds um around whether we've already whether it's already slowed down it's quite a tricky thing as i said to actually observe directly and there's quite a bit of um uh, natural fluctuations that occur so getting long-term trends is very difficult so we do tend to rely a lot on numerical models to help us to try and figure out what's going on um, and also predict what might happen uh, into the future Oh, my slide was just coming up. I just put it in the wrong spot. All right, we already know the answer to that, right? Are you going to be, you do it anyway, you do it really quickly um, because we know that <clears throat> this is more like a test, isn't it? Because now I'm testing whether you paid attention. We'll see what answers we get. You should be able to select multiple answers as well. Are you actually paying attention or not? <laughs> Maybe it doesn't let you select multiple answers. It must Definitely. do though, if my maths is good. All right, well, that's a shame, guys, because I wanted you to select all. <laughs> the yeah, the meridional uh, overturning circulation is important to all, um, all of them, so quick. If you haven't submitted them, uh, go in there and select all of them. I'll, I will. It's a good opportunity to, re to reiterate to you as well, though. Um, so that overturning circulation is really important for reoxygenation, which is the first one on the list there. It's really important for modulating our atmospheric temperatures, so it helps to move, um, move heat around the entire globe. Uh, it's really important to us for both um, removing excess heat and removing carbon dioxide because it can take those gases and take them down to the deep ocean and, and essentially keep them down there for on the order of a thousand years. All right, so uh, this uh, is a kind of zoom in of uh, what we talked about very early on in the presentation today. Um, so now we're just looking at the effects in the northern hemisphere of a shutdown of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. OK, so we see um, the colour here is showing how the temperature will change with blue colours uh, being uh, negative changes if we had complete shutdown. So right now they're kind of debating whether or not it's slowing down, um, but this is saying there is no more circulation. The ocean is basically stagnant, um, and and this is you know th this is what will happen. So very dramatic changes uh, in the in the temperatures across Europe um, as a result. And of course, as we saw back at that beginning of the presentation, in the southern hemisphere, we see in general increases in temperature um, as the as the circulation uh, shuts down. 
So I said at the beginning of this um, part of the presentation that uh, one component uh, that's important both in terms of sea level and in terms of the um, meridional overturning circulation um, is the uh, what's happening to our ice sheets. And I thought it was be interesting to look at some of the recent kind of research around what's happening in Antarctic and particularly on the Thwaites Glacier, which you also may know as the Doomsday Glacier. Um, and the reason why it has this name is because it has got a very large volume of water um, stored within this um, glacier. And, and so um, I can't remember what the number is, but if it were all to melt, then the sea level rise would be extreme. So that's shown in the map here, its location here. And the important thing to note here in terms of the dynamic of how it operates, and I guess the risk uh, that is there, is that the colour here is showing you the um, uh, height relative to the sea level across the Antarctic. Uh, continent. So you can see there's these areas that are kind of this orange and yellow colours, they're above the sea level, whereas these um, teal colours are actually below the sea level. And that's one of the reasons why this glacier is um, quite uh, problematic. Uh, so this is now looking at a cross section, so we, if we look at a cross section through the glacier like this, uh, what it looks like. So um, this is the, the the ocean here, and this is uh, further onto the um, uh, Antarctic continent. And you can see that this glacier is um, sitting um, uh, in this area where the uh, solid continent is well below the sea level. So this is what is here, um, but it also gets lower. Um, here, so, that, so this is the rock profile here, this is the ice above it, so it actually gets lower um, as you go away from the ocean. And so this means that if salt water can find its way in here, then potentially very quickly the whole glacier uh, is lost. And the reason for this um, is, is because of this type of dynamic that's in this schematic here. So uh, this is the current kind of setup where we have the Thwaites Glacier sitting here. The ice flows permanently towards the ocean. Uh, this is what we call uh, the ice shelf. So this part really doesn't um, contribute too much to sea level rise if this part melts because um, it's floating on the sea and so it's already um, already part of the ocean, whereas this part here is uh, sitting on the continent. Uh, so when, uh, so we call this the grounding line, the place where the ice sheet and the ice shelf uh, meet, uh, where the seawater uh, comes into. Um, uh, but what uh, is likely to happen is that, um, well, what happens under this ice, ice ice shelf here is you get this circulation of water which accelerates the melting of ice underneath the ice sheet um, because warm water can come in. Um, and the 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 uh, identified issue is that if you um, can move water past this point uh, where the uh, rock, the continent, um, goes well below the sea level, then it's going to very rapidly erode away the ice underneath it. Um, uh, and, and that's really the reason why this um, glacier, I guess, is potentially has quite a, um, uh, quite a strong tipping point, as in um, when you uh, push it past a certain point, the response it will potentially just be an acceleration and it will be very difficult to slow it down at that point. So that's why a lot of scientists are very focused on, on studying this problem in more detail. 
So people are actually putting instruments under under ice sheets to try and take measurements. So autonomous vehicles, for example, um, going under these ice sheets to to make um, detailed measurements. There's there's also uh, what they found is that underneath the ice shelf, there's lots of little detailed uh, crevices. And again, you know, understanding that the ice sheet is ice shelf is not just some uniform uh, mass of ice, but it has all these really intricate details. And none of this, of course, is captured in these very large scale models that we put together to try and understand what's going on. So instead, we have to try and think about, well, how can we simplify that so we can capture the response uh, in a prediction um, uh, without having to model every single little uh, crevice and, and things that feature that's in the ice. So that uh, draws me to uh, a close. And I guess um, to finish with, before I take your questions, um, I really just want to emphasise that, you know, we are really trying to understand the ocean at, at the same time that we're trying to predict uh, what's going to happen um, due to anthropogenic uh, changes. So we're very reliant on things like numerical models. Um, we use a lot of observations, and I gave you some examples today of how the technology has just changed very, very rapidly and enabled us to um, look at the ocean and, and, and observe the ocean in a very different way and therefore understand the ocean a lot better. Uh, and we can also look back at geological records. So that allows us to understand what happened um, in previous changes of uh, ocean sea level and so on, and what were the connections to the ocean circulation. So there's a whole um, uh, uh, discipline of actually paleo oceanography, where people look at paleo records to understand how the ocean used to operate. Very complex, right? Because not even the continents were in the same place if you go back far enough. Um, so really fascinating stuff, but also really helpful to understand what may happen uh, into the future. I also would like to make the point that, you know, predicting the future is actually really tricky in the ocean because there's lots of feedbacks and a lot of them are quite tricky to understand well. Uh, so that's a lot of the focus of scientists is really to try and understand all of those processes as well as we can um, so that we can really define where we think those tipping points uh, will likely occur. Um, and that hopefully makes it so that we can uh, become more resilient uh, and plan for changes that we expect. But as I said at the beginning, also to hopefully motivate us to really um, defiantly uh, stop um, uh, our emissions so that so so that we do have a chance to keep the ocean in as close to state as we as we can. And I really, you know, it's fantastic that you you students are taking these courses and I hope that you do continue on your studies um, in this area or something adjacent because we need all your brilliant minds to really be working um, on these types of problems, but also, you know, efficiency of motors and, um, you know, better solar cells, like there's lots of kind of engineering, science, um, but also ethics and um, politics and all these areas where we need your minds to really kind of come come through for us and, and uh, put, point us back in the right direction, I think, or I hope. Um, so yes, I now have a uh, question slide, but I'm also happy to um, listen to your questions as well. So whatever you're more comfortable with, um, please ask some questions. Well, I've got one, I've got a few. Okay. Um, when you talk about your global um, sea level rise, um, you had like your, your chart there, which showed the average of sea level rise. Yeah, going right back to the beginning. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, to know. Oh. Yeah, then. Yeah, that one. How come there was such a big jump between, is it like 2012 ish to 2016? Is it due to Enzo there? Or. Yeah, so I. Um, don't know the exact answer to that, but yes, in this 
in this record, there will be all sorts of um, natural oscillations, uh, which include um, ENSO, um, but also include, you know, Indian Ocean Dipole, um, the Southern Annular Mode, like all these other oscillations that occur within the ocean that that bring out these large changes that can occur ac across the globe. So yes, all of that is in uh, the record and I I don't know the details to that, sorry. That's all right. Questions from you guys? Okay, I'll go again. <laughs> um, when you spoke about, I think you had a, a chart around um, Increasing sea level at different locations. Yep. Was that the the map? This one. Yeah, that one there. Do you know, um, due to your like modelling or predicting, what's the like the hot spot for the next decade? Do you know? Do you know anything about that? Uh, where do we need to be most concerned? Yeah. Yeah. Um. I mean, there are areas where there, there are certainly islands um, in the, you know, closer to the equator that are, um, well, people are already having to uh, move away from. So there are already, you know, climate refugees from some of our smaller islands in the um, South Pacific are certainly examples, but also uh, in the Indian Ocean. So it's that I guess it it like many of these things, it's not just that there's a change in sea level, it's also is there an economy to support adapting to that change? And yeah. so, you know, how well it will be dealt with throughout the world is going to be heavily dependent on uh, whether that, you know, whether engineering kind of solutions can be enacted. So um, I think all these areas that are dark blue are, are our places where, where there is um, increased risk. And then if we go to uh, a map like this, which yeah. showed us our ampli amplification factor, any of those areas, you know, from the kind of orange at 100 out to your dark red at 1,000, certainly um, very, very high uh, impact. But, yeah, this one, this plot, I'll just point out, is is still uh, 20, uh, 20, 30, what is it, 20 to... Um, 40 years in the future, right? So um, these are these are predictions, and this is based on a particular scenario. Whereas what we were looking at on the previous figure was actual um, observations of how much things had changed in since 1993 to 2021. So um, yeah. yeah. Okay. There, there, there are going to there, things. Are happening now, and and people are having to respond now. Yeah. Um, do you guys have any questions? Because I have one more. Yes, we have got a question. This is the Asian stay relation of these things now. So you can see you've got levels dramatically. Yes. Did you hear that, Professor, or I'm not? I only heard bits of it. Sorry. Can you repeat it, please? Later. Um, they said the doomsday relation to amount of civil race sea levels dramatically. How much is dramatically? Uh, how much is dramatically if the ha, ha, so what sea level would happen if the doomsday glacier were all to melt? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I bet if you Google that, you find out pretty quickly. I cannot remember the number, but um, but yeah, I think meters. Okay. Any more questions? I've got one more. If that's okay. Yeah. Um, can you? maybe like predict how much carbon dioxide has been stored um, in the ocean due to overturning circulation or you can't really predict that? Um, so what I, it's not my area of expertise, but yeah. um, 
there is a good portion of the of the excess carbon dioxide that we have created has already been stored in the ocean and it, and it's quite large i can't remember the percentage though i i can um send that to you some information to you later but what the what the important thing to understand is that it's doing something for us but the time scale it can respond on is too short, right? So that a thousand year time scale is problematic for us as humans and potentially for the earth itself if we were to rely on that. So if we if we stopped, you know, if we managed to kind of stop emissions in the next, you know, 10, 20 years, there's already going to be a legacy that will continue. And if we rely on the meridional overturning circulation and the natural processes of weathering to absorb all of that carbon dioxide, it would take a really long time for the, the temperature um, of the globe to regulate and come to a new equilibrium. Yeah. So this is why, you know, people are thinking about other ways to store carbon in the ocean and faster ways to store carbon in the ocean um, so that we can uh, help to regulate our temperature in in the um the global temperatures much faster yeah it's like carbon capture underground that kind of stuff is that what you're referring to there is that but there's also the potential of um enhancing alkalinity in the ocean or um accelerating the biological pump through um fertilizing the ocean with iron for example so i don't know if these are concepts that you've talked about at all but um, these are things that chemical oceanographers um, are thinking a lot about. And, you know, if you if you look at the IPCC reports, it really does say that something else is going to need to happen if we want to um, regulate temperatures. But, yeah, I'm not talking about what um, emitters are doing to kind of say, well, we, we could offset some of our emissions by um, bearing some... Uh, carbon dioxide I'm saying you know just to if we stopped all of our emissions there's still going to be a problem with temperatures increasing and so yeah. we need to do something more 